Well, good morning, everybody. I wanted to start you off with a question I got yesterday in the comment section on uh, YouTube here. And the question was about how much energy is contained in thunderstorms. And I just want to make it kind of clear on, on just the vast amount of energy that's in each one of these storms. So as you look at this satellite animation, I want to talk about the little guys like this one right down here on the border between uh, you know Alabama and Georgia, that little storm right there yesterday. We would kind of call this a garden variety storm. So it kind of popped up here on the heat of the day and uh, it wasn't expansive. It maybe fills in an entire uh, U.S. county. I mean, you can pick these out all over the country. These little storms that pop up. So the way we would calculate the total amount of energy in the storm is a simple way is just to look at how much liquid is in it because that was once water vapor that condensed, released a lot of latent heat to then become uh, you know, the rain that came out of this. Now there's lots of additional sources of energy in thunderstorms like that of, of lightning. But what I'm gonna talk about here is just the conversion of vapor into uh, a liquid. Now for a very small thunderstorm, like some of the pop-up ones we had down here in the southeast, or maybe this guy right here in parts of uh, Minnesota, we generally find that they contain about 20 to 40 kilotons uh, of energy. So if you think about that, I put it in kilotons because it's easier to reference these against you know, bombs. And so that would be uh, you know, the size of or double the size of uh, the, the Fat Man bomb, which was dropped in August 1945 um, on Nagasaki. I say all that because if you were to watch a 24-hour loop of satellite data just across the United States on a typical summer day like we're watching here, I mean, look at the size of that storm there that was in Missouri last night. You add up all of the, the energy from all of this, you know, it vastly exceeds the world's nuclear arsenal. Why does it not blow the entire planet up? It's because it's slowly released and it's dispersed over a large area. And so it's about timing and it's about concentration. But it's just an incredible thing to think about. So that was a great question. I really appreciate it being asked. But as we watch this animation, there's one other thing I want to point out before we talk about these storms and the flooding. And that is just the wildfire smoke that we're seeing here uh, out of Oregon. It's getting into Washington. And it's we had some larger fires in Montana and Idaho as well, but they're underneath some cloud cover in this particular animation. But the last couple of days, we've had a lot of focus on the flooding that came out of southern Iowa into Missouri. And so this is just a map focused in on Missouri, looking at the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. So we can see here that there are uh, several places that have exceeded my color bar, so over 10 inches of rainfall. And just to pick a, a location right here uh, in this heavy band uh, in parts of Missouri, I'm just going to go to my website, agweather.com, ag-wx.com, and I'm going to choose uh, Winnegan, which is a city in Missouri or town of Missouri. In fact, it is the 27,904th largest city in the country. So we click on it, and that puts the index number there, and you click Submit, and my forecast system goes out and generates a custom forecast here. So there's always stats at the top, as you can see. So in the last 72 hours, this uh, location has had 8.74 inches of rainfall. And this is one of the things we always have to be careful about when remembering historical precipitation statistics. Because if you slide down here, this is what's kind of crazy. Right now, this location is at 91% of normal precipitation on the year. And when we use statistics just purely based like that without context, we would not understand the two long episodes of drought leading up to this particular rainfall event, which means the crops grown in this area endured since about May 10th, exceptional uh, drought conditions. And as you know, before the rain came in lately, um, you know, it, it was it was to the tune of um, multiple days of 100 degree heat. In fact, if you come up here and click on year to date temperatures, you'll be able to see all of the, you know, the very hot temperatures that were endured in this particular area and where we currently stand. So it's just a, a way to, to assess all this. We can also come in here and look at the next 10 days of precipitation because we're not done. Uh, the ECMWF, the GFS, and the National Blended Models, when you look at all three of them, we're looking at a range over the next 10 days of somewhere between an inch and an inch and three quarters. The GFS and the MBM being the most aggressive, the European at 1.37 inches. Now, what will be interesting to see is all of this... Um, excuse me, all this rainfall that's happened. Let me show you this one. There we go. In the last 72 hours, you know, this fell on, you know, the Missouri um, Missouri River uh, watershed, part of it. And uh, we can also see some of this fell on the Mississippi and the Ohio River. And I'm curious to see how this gets into the river. So right now at Memphis, where this will eventually go past, the river is 4.14 feet below low stage as of 5 a.m. this morning. So we'll probably get another surge of this um, you know, the river depth, which is going to be important to watch as we go into fall. But just coming back to this figure again, you know, we had isolated storms uh, throughout the northern plains. 
We had storms that produced hail coming out of Colorado into Nebraska, and then a lot of thunderstorm activity here over the Intermountain West. Again, we see all of this, but it's just still not that full-blown monsoonal flow that is missing. Storms throughout the Great Lakes in the last three days, also over here in parts of the southeast getting up to Virginia, locally producing some very heavy rain, as you see down here in Florida. But if we just take a look at the latest radar loop, this is going back over the last 12 hours or so. Here are the flooding rains coming through Missouri. You can see them training, see how they follow one another. And at the end of this animation, that's now, early this morning, I should say, if you're watching this in the morning with me. And uh, we had just, um, just torrential amounts of rain fall in this area and more uh, is coming. Now I want to come back and show you something else that was happening over here in Colorado. So here's just another animation kind of zoomed in on Colorado. And we've kind of had a, an interesting time looking at the outflow of thunderstorms on radar. And I always just find this fascinating. So I'm going to show it to you again. Watch this reset and watch these early storms in Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. See their outflow just race, or not Montana, forgive me, Nebraska. Uh, but watch it again. You can see their outflow. I'll just take you back here diving south out of each of these storms and when those come over they can kick up if there is a lot of dust and they can also kick up a very strong wind and a brief shot at some colder air but at the end of this you can again see how the storms watch them just train over the top of one another here coming into parts of kansas south of kansas city here but going right across parts of missouri now i bring this up because in colorado right now that district we just talked about the storms coming out of wyoming into colorado since the beginning of 2023 is having its wettest year on record and this is after enduring three straight years of exceptional drought in the western plains of the united states so the statistic here again is january 1st through august 2nd looking at precipitation ranks by climate district so we're trying to capture this entire year uh, worth of precipitation here in, in one statistic now, I understand how dry it has been in, in this part of the central United States. And I just want to show you in the last two weeks, there's been this region that stretches from parts of West Virginia and Kentucky through southern Indiana, Illinois, through western Illinois, straight through Iowa. Look at northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, that lower county or that southern county of, row of county, excuse me, in, in Minnesota, very agriculture productive, missing. This goes right over the top of this part of um, you know, of South Dakota into North Dakota. And that is an area that desperately needs filled in for the crops that are grown there. August is an incredibly important month. Same thing down here farther to the south. If you look at the southern half of um, you know, Oklahoma, coming over to Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, back to Louisiana, and then most of Texas, bone dry. And we're concerned about this continuing. While there are better chances for rainfall getting back into Idaho and Montana, most of the rest of the Pacific Northwest stays very dry, which means the fire risk is going to continue. And we see California is quite dry as well compared to its climatological average. Now, currently this morning, again, I want to show you the latest um, uh, lightning data here. We were watching that those storms continue to train over the same locations. And that's why in those areas this morning, we do have the flood watches that are out. We also have flood watches here. Parts of the eastern uh, side of the Snake River Valley out of Salt Lake City, but then getting here uh, into this part of Wyoming, Montana, and, and South Dakota. This is a dense fog advisor early this morning in this part of the western and central Corn Belt, but all of this to the south remains the excessive heat warnings and watches uh, in place for this area. Red flag warnings west. So storms today, we're going to watch again right here, Kansas, Colorado, and Nebraska. We're going to see the storms that are kind of training right in through this area potentially become severe coming into parts of the Tennessee Valley, clipping parts of uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. And we'll keep an eye in this part of Ontario getting into upstate New York as well for some strong to severe storms. Tomorrow, it's going to primarily be focused here. This will be on the 4th. But as we get into the end of this week, remember, we're watching this low that today is spinning here that's going to move out slowly, come across South Dakota, and eventually make its way over to the Great Lakes. And the environment to the south of it on the 5th opens up a large section here of the central United States to the risk of severe storms. And the Storm Prediction Center is again watching that on day, um, this would be on day 4, which gets us out there to, um, you know, this weekend, we're going to keep an eye on Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and then day five, that moves into parts of the Eastern Corn Belt, the Eastern Great Lakes, and into New England. So all of this is coming from this event that's taking place today, whoops, sorry, right here. So let's add it up using the high res NAM. I'm just going to play this quickly. This is a 60 hour forecast, which means it takes us out there to midday Saturday. So a lot of thunderstorm activity in this corridor. Okay. We've talked about that a lot this week. 
The new feature is the low that's here that's going to curl up initially in this area and then make a hard turn as it runs over the big Texas Ridge straight through uh, parts of uh, South Dakota over toward Minnesota. But it's a slow mover as we talked about yesterday. So that short wave we're keeping an eye on will be here this afternoon. Okay, so watch this guy right here. It goes over the top of the broader ridge and it snakes right through here. This is by Friday morning. Getting into Saturday, one of the big problems with this low getting farther to the north are the two troughs that are to its north right now. And neither of these is helping grab it and pull it farther to the north. And the disappointment there is that we needed to get more of that rain into North Dakota. We need to get it into northern Minnesota and into southern Alberta, excuse me, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. But instead, the shortwave goes right over the top of like Sioux Falls and heads across Iowa. See it there? This is by Sunday as we play this out there. And on Monday, it's moving over Lake Michigan. By Tuesday, it's here. So this is a like a five-day track of a single shortwave that we're going to have to watch carefully. At the end of this, I'll just keep playing it out. Do you see how there's another wave? Watch this guy right here coming out of Idaho. Goes right across the midsection of the country. I'm keeping an eye right in this corridor here. And that low is getting pulled to the south of a deeper one that's over the Hudson Bay. And this has been an important feature, okay? Every long-range model forecast it feels like for the last month has underestimated the depth of this when we look at the week two forecast of it. Does that make sense? When we look at their longer range, it never gets the depth of this trough right. So because of that, it doesn't get the size of this ridge right either. But now we're starting to see that the models are honing in on a pattern of redeveloping large ridges here with a lot of northwest flow through the midsection of the country. So what that ends up doing, at least in the next seven days, is this. So this is in the very near term. The low is curling up here. Moving out, we saw its trajectory doing something like that. So the potential for very heavy rainfall in this part of the country and then in through here is, is pretty well documented by the models and very wet in parts of New England. Our drier spots just continue to stay very evident on these maps. And I'm just going to kind of highlight those just so we can keep an eye on it. Also notice this part of the Mid-Atlantic showing up drier too. So let's go ahead and look at it with the uh, European model. Okay, so you got these two regions. We'll watch one here and the second one there. So this is playing through the rest of the day today, getting into tonight. Let's play this out into Friday morning, Friday midday, Friday evening. You can see the first round has passed now, the east coast here. Wetter conditions in New England. But watch the low that's curling up right here. This low comes out of Wyoming and Montana, delivers heavy rain along what appears, you know, in the current model runs, appears to be right here along the border between the Dakotas. This is now Saturday afternoon and evening, getting into Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, playing this out there to Monday morning, afternoon, and evening. And look how slow that is, just moving across the country. And as you saw, there's a second short wave here that's going to dive in this direction. So watch, here it is. Heavy rain down south ahead of it. Here comes that next low. See it right in through there? This is by next Thursday. So out in the next week, we have two systems rolling across the midsection of the country over the big ridge south. So we end up painting a corridor in through here that's going to be quite stormy overall. And it's best just to see that by going to the ensemble probabilities for heavy rainfall. So this is the chance of getting an inch in the next 10 days. Remember, this is the 90 to 100% down here. We look at the really heavy corridors. This is the chance of getting two inches and the chance of getting four. And on the drier side of it, this is the probability of getting less than half of an inch. And our narrative kind of continues on those very dry regions that we've talked about for much of this week, but we've now seen a bit of an increase right here in the latest model runs. Okay, by day 10, the ensembles continue to produce the same features we talked about all week. The deeper trough here, the positive PNA pattern diving into this trough that's centered around the Great Lakes to Hudson Bay. It's a lot of Northwest flow, which means we get the ridge running short waves that come over the top. But this large ridge to the south means just expansive heat into this area. And that's why the week two forecasts continue to show that same line I've drawn for several forecast videos in a row. It's in all three models. Remember the two dry bias we've got in the GFS here, but you can see that there's a broad section of the country that is gonna be seeing better chances for seeing storms over the next 10 plus days. Now, I wanna show you from the Climate Prediction Center that day eight through 14 map over here uh, alongside their temperature map, because this really just illustrates the, the poor handling of the colder conditions. Again, this is colder with respect to normal August temperatures that have been in this area, uh, because most models had out there that we too tried to make this far too warm. The excessive heat is just all along the southern tier of the United States, and then 
later in the time period running up into the western United States. I say later in the time period because of this. Here's today's maximum temperatures compared to average. And just another day of triple digit heat in this part of the country. It's hot north in the middle where all the clouds are and rain. That's where we're expecting to be cool. But notice as we play through Friday, getting into Saturday and Sunday, we're not seeing terribly hot conditions here across the west. This is pretty common. We're, we're quite used to this. But look how cold the air is behind that low that's moving slowly across the country toward New England into early next week, while the whole southern tier of the U.S. here just stays absolutely scorched with temperatures. This is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So there is a brief kind of reprieve of the heat in the west, but it does come back on as we look out here in the longer range. So this is the next five days, average temperature anomalies. This slides out today 5 through 10, and this is day 10 through 15 as the ridge seems to be really gaining a lot of strength here in the west. So I'm thinking right now that there seems to be pretty solid evidence that the Pacific Northwest, by the time we get to the middle of the month, will be experiencing excessive heat. And that did show up in the latest CPC forecast for the uh, week two. So the 10th through the 16th, they've now increased this area for the risk of uh, excessive heat. It's going to stay here, but this is the area that we've seen the uh, increases as of late. Okay, last couple things to pick up on here. Anything going on in the tropics? Right now, the National Hurricane Center has uh, no new tropical activity. Let's see if we've got an, another update. Nope, still just the 2 a.m. update here. And I did notice that over the next um, 10 days, though, the European Ensemble is attempting to take one of these African easterly waves and giving it a better chance, a 50 to 70% chance of developing in this area. What I want you to see by watching the trajectory of this the probability of getting a tropical system is this would suggest that the Bermuda High has kind of flattened out here in the middle part of the Atlantic. Remember how it had been displaced pretty far to the east? And if that becomes a more normal position, we've got to start watching the you know Atlantic very carefully. We are just, to be honest, statistically at the beginning of the hurricane season. I know the hurricane season begins in June, but when you want to think about the most active time of year, it, it, it really just starts right about now. Okay, taking you somewhere else around the world real quick, I want to show you um, the in, in, um, this is from the Indian Meteorological Department. I'm going to look at the monsoon very quickly here because if you look at anomaly, I want you to focus on this map over here. I apologize that it's quite small. You notice that outside of the Ganges River Valley, most of India has had above normal precipitation when you look at the cumulative statistic here. Um, I also want to show you uh, this. This would be the All India Rainfall Time Series. So it's important for us to have a look at this just because of um, you know, there's one and a half billion people here and thinking about the agricultural productivity is quite important uh, for the food security of this area. There was a pretty sizable early deficit, but they have since had a lot of um, just flooding and it's brought them back up to their normal values here. So they've gone from one extreme to the other. And if we look over the next 10 days, we see that much of southern India, central India getting over here where they grow a lot of cotton. Uh, is going to be very dry, but that one area that was in deficit around the Ganges River Valley is expected to be extremely wet. Uh, we do are paying close attention to typhoon activity over in the Pacific, but uh, after last week's torrential rains that came through eastern parts of uh, China here, they're getting a drier go this week. A lot of storms continue throughout Europe. We see a lot of activity coming through Central Africa, which means we need to be watching systems coming out in this direction over the next 10 days. You can now see North America in kind of full contrast here, where it's drier on either side of that wetter corridor. And in South America, there's still this ongoing narrative about just how hot it is right now. The latest update here um, shows that we've got some places that are 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit above the climatological average, which means that here in the middle of winter, there are some places that are approaching triple digit heat uh, in, um, in parts of Argentina, getting up toward like Paraguay uh, and Chile as well. But to take note, Europe is cooler, parts of Russia very hot, most of Australia much above average in the middle of winter as well. So it's just good to kind of keep this global perspective as we walk through this month of August. So I'll look forward to giving you another update in the morning. Until then, have a good one. Thank you.